Ooh, that looks tasty. Before you stands a dungeon filled with monsters and treasures, but most importantly, with the fabled Ring of Creation. Gather your party. Enter the dungeon. Face the dragon. Claim the ring. Of course, it's up to you if you want to claim the ring for yourself or share it with your party. Welcome, folks, to The Hunger Gamer is back with another game review. And today we are talking about Bag of Dungeon, a fantasy adventure game from Gunpowder Studios designed by Tim Charville. So this is a game that was a recent Kickstarter fulfillment. It's one that I had kind of missed out on. I think I may have seen it, but I just didn't have the time to stop and dive in, and then I think I forgot about it, because as you know, I'm all about dungeon games. Now this one is a particularly quick, fast, and light dungeon crawl. The idea is it is literally you are entering into this dungeon and you are trying to find the magic ring and get out. When you find the magic ring, there's going to be a dragon that doesn't want you to leave. And the twist is that there are two modes you can play. You can play competitive or cooperative. If you play competitive, there can be only one, which means once you find the ring, you can take each other out. But of course, you might need the help in order to kill the dragon. So it's kind of a balance that you're playing there. Or you can play cooperatively, in which case you are just trying to work together, get the ring, beat the dragon, and then that is the end of the game. And you can play this with one to four players. Now, if you are not remotely interested in how this game is played, and would rather just get to my final thoughts, you're gonna to wanna to jump ahead to the timestamp on the screen right now. For those of us who are still here, let's talk about how this works and what I have here in front of me. So first of all, I have selected two characters. You can see I've selected the dwarf and I've selected the elf. And right now I have them both on the female side. However, I will say that the four characters have both a male side and a female side and you know different names and stuff for all of them. My copy also did come with these two Kickstarter bonus characters. It was the Halfling and the Minotaur. I do not know if the production copies are going to be coming with these or not, so I'm certainly not going to use them, but they're out there, and I would not be surprised if at the very least you're able to get a print-and-play version of these. In any event, we have our two characters, and each character has their action points, and you mark that with your cube here. It has the number of lives that they have. If you are playing competitive, each person has three lives, and when you die, you come back at the pool of healing. If you die three times, you're just out. But if you are playing solo, then you just have the one life. If you're dead, you are dead. Then there are their life points right here, and then this here is the monster damage tracker. So if you're fighting, this is how you track damage on the monster rather than trying to drop tokens out there in front of you. And the last thing I'll talk about here is that on the tracker here, you'll see these asterisks. If you're fighting a monster that has six to nine health and you kill it, you will receive one piece of treasure. And if you kill a monster that has 10 or more, you will receive two pieces of treasure. Speaking of monsters and treasure, you have a bag, hence Bago Dungeon, of treasure. And as you play and you find stuff or you kill stuff, you draw it and you see what you are going to find. In this case, I found a magical shield, which I need one hand to use and it will give me minus two damage. And I could place that right there on my hero. And it shows you here what it is you're able to carry. Two hands, one piece of body armor, one pair of boots, two other items you can carry, and this is a symbol for spells, and I will tell you that spells, when you use them, they are gone. They're like scrolls. Everything else you can keep using unless it says otherwise. Then there are the monsters, and I will just show you a monster. Let me grab one at random, and here we have the troll. 
Very simple, you see the troll has 10 health, and when it fights, you roll two dice and add four. And I'll talk about the combat in just a little bit. The way the game works, let me take that item off, is you are going to be going through this stack of tiles. And when you get all the way down to the bottom, you lay the last tile, then the ring of creation here, it's a little campfire thing, the ring of creation will appear somewhere on the board. Somewhere in the dungeon it will appear. And if there is no monster where it appears, and the monster will kind of spawn with a little guardian. And once someone picks up the ring, the dragon will appear, and the dragon will always appear on the exit tile. It is trying to keep you in the dungeon, doesn't want you to leave with its ring. And I know what you're thinking, Hungry, there's no stats on that dragon. That's because the stats are in the book. It's very simple, it is 20 health, and it does four dice of damage, and it always does that, and that's just the way it goes. So let's dive in and kind of see how this works. I'm gonna move these a little closer to me. And when you're moving, it costs you one action point to discover a new tile, and one action point to move. That's pretty much all you are going to do with your action points, unless you have an item that needs action points, or you have a special ability that costs action points. Like you can see here, the healer can spend three action points to heal two six-sided dice worth of health to someone on the same tile set. So we'll start out and we will say that my elf is going to take the lead and see what's out there. So she has six action points. She's going to use one and discover a tile. Oh, and there we have a tile that has an item already on it. So I place it and you'll notice it's got the walls there. You have to place it in a way that works. And there it is. The way these item tiles work is the first person to land on it gets an item. Then I will spend another action point. Doink, step forward onto the tile. I'm gonna put these face down so you can see the little meeple goodness a little better. And then I simply get to go to my bag here, dig in there, and I have found a spear trap. So unfortunately for me, I thought I found something delightful, but instead I found death. So I'll take my die, roll a d6, ooh, and I took five damage. That is a glorious start for my elf. One, two, three, four, five. I still have more action points. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna be crazy. I'm going to explore, explore, explore. So one, two, three, which means I'll have one action point left. And here, this one's gonna have a monster on it. You'll see it has the M3 there. And I'll go ahead and pull a random monster and it goes face down. Here is another one, also has a monster. And you'll notice this turns a corner and I'll put it going that way. And again, another monster goes on it. And then I also said I wanted to explore there and it has just a straight corridor. And I have one movement left. And I'm just going to run away, because I'm a coward. And I'll put this back to the top for my next turn. Now, my dwarf, and my dwarf will move one to here. And you know what? The dwarf is a dwarf. He wants to fight. So I'll move one more. Doink. And I'm going to go and fight this monster right here. As soon as I step there, I can flip it over and I see it is a monk. The monk rolls two dice and adds four, has eight health. So I'll take my health monster health tracker, put it to eight. Now you'll notice that my dwarf here rolls 2d6 plus three. So that's actually not very good. So he's gonna call for help. This is one of the other abilities you can do. It's called tagging. He's gonna spend one action and call for help. My elf here can run over and help him fight as long as she would have the movement to do so. And since she'd already done her whole turn, she can go one, two, to run over and help. Now the elf rolls 2d6 plus one, but because this is a tag team, you don't add them all up, you simply get one more die for the person who is helping you. So here's how combat works. And before I do that, I'm just going to move my elf back over here because I will explain that why in a little bit because the way damage is taken is a little bit different. But, so here we are, just pretending it was just my dwarf fighting here. 
2d6 plus 4 for the monk, 2d6 plus 3 for my dwarf. So what I would do is I would start out and I'm going to roll for my dwarf, 2d6 plus 3, and you'll see I have an 8. I'll just move that up to remember that's an 8, and 2d6 plus 4 for the monk. 7 plus 4, that makes it an 11. So the monk outfought my dwarf, and you'll see it has outfought my dwarf by 3. 11 minus 8 being 3, so my dwarf takes 3 damage. 1, 2, 3. Now I will say that had the elf been there, that damage would have been divided evenly if possible. If not possible, then the dwarf would have taken 2, the elf would have taken 1. Then it is a rinse and repeat. We continue fighting. So we'll do another round. Here goes my dwarf. There we go. That's a 9. Plus 3 is a 12. There we go. And then the monk has a 2 plus 4. That is a total of 6. So that means the dwarf wailed on this monk doing 6 damage. And so it goes down. It has 2 health left. And here we go. This third round should hopefully do it. Here's my dwarf. Nope, not good. That's a total of a 5. There we go. And luckily, I didn't get wailed on because that's a total of an 8 minus 5. So the dwarf takes 3 more damage. 1, 2, 3. And now I'm going to say the dwarf's going to call for help. He's going to use an action. And now my elf, 1, 2, will run over and is going to help. Now, if we are playing cooperative, it doesn't really matter. But if you're playing competitive, you spend the action to call for help, and then they have the choice to do it. So you could spend your action, and they say, mm, nope, you can die. The other thing that happens is you can make an agreement before you go in that you will get the loot, or you will get some of the loot, or what's going to happen. So in other words, the dwarf can call for help. Once I've called for help, the other person is the elf can say, well, what are you going to give me if I do this? And they say, well, I'll give you the treasure or whatever it may be. But in this case, I'm playing cooperative, so my elf runs over. So now I get to add a third dice. So now this time my dwarf is rolling 3d6 plus 3. And you'll see I have 9, 11, 14 total. There we go. Just so I remember that was 14. Oh, it doesn't matter because I need both dice. So I have 14 and then two dice. That is 9 plus 4. 13. So I only did one damage to the monk, but had I not gotten the elves' help, I would have died. And now hopefully this last round here will finish it off. Oh my, that is a 7, 10, 11 for my dwarf. And that is a 10 for the monk. The monk has been defeated. There we go. I take that. This goes over here to the dwarf, marking that he has to kill. And then because it had over 6 health but less than 10, I go to the bag and I get to draw one item. And this time I manage to find a tornado. There we are. And you'll see that that is a spell. And spells, you use it and it goes away. And since the elf helped, I'm going to say that the dwarf is going to give that to the elf as a prize. You see how that works. And you simply play through the game in this fashion. You're finding gear, you're fighting things. And the reason that you hold on to these kills is you can do a kind of a semi-co-op version where if you want to play together where you're not killing each other, you're just trying to get the ring and get out, but you still want to see who did the best, you can do a who has the most kills tracker there. Okay, so here I've just kind of filled out the entire dungeon. It wouldn't happen this way because as you can see all these monsters here, there's no way for me to actually get to any of them without having fought them. But this kind of gives you an idea and also will let me explain the last two things that I wanted to actually show you. Well, the last three things because I did forget to say that when you do pick up an item, you take one of these just little tokens here and you put it on there and that just marks that you have already found the item that is there. The other thing that I need to say is, as you look through here, you can see that I was actually starting to run out of places that I could go. And for example, here, there's a space there, but there's really only one shape that I could put there, and that would be another corner going that way. 
Because if I had, say, this one here and tried to place it, then it would not work because I would wind up closing off these passages there. And any time that you are unable to place a tile because it doesn't work for some reason, then it's just assumed that you got confused, you got lost, and you just lose the rest of your action points. The other thing that I need to explain to you is how ranged attacks work. Because if you've been looking closely, you'll see that the elf gets plus one range and plus one damage with a bow. And so you'll see, if I had found this elven bow here, it takes both my hands, it costs me two action points, has a range of one to four, and does a d6 of damage. Damage. Or in the case of the elf, it has a range of 1 to 5 and does 1d6 plus 1. So I'll just equip it here and place it right here in between my two, marking that both hands are taken. And so the way range attacks work is they go in straight lines. So I'll just place myself right here. And I have a range of 1 to 4. So I could shoot at this, this, or this, any of those monsters. And so I would take my two action points, 1, 2, and I would roll my 2d6 and add one, and I'll just say I'm shooting at this fellow right there. So I roll my 2d6, add one, that is seven, and I do seven damage straight up to the monster. And I'll take my tokens here, and I will mark that I have done seven damage. The way I do this is I make a black count as five, and the reds count as singles. So. That one has seven damage to it. It might be dead, it might not be dead. And so let's just say then I'm gonna run in, one, two, and try to finish it off with my sword. So I would get there, I'd flip it over, and take a look. In this case, it's another monk. So it's not dead, but it would start the fight with only one health. And I would have a much better chance of taking it out. Had, let's say I had rolled an eight, then it would be dead, I would get there, flip it over, I find that it is dead, I put it down, and then I would claim its treasure, whatever it may be. So that is how ranged works. And the last thing, as I already mentioned at the beginning, once you place this last tile, whatever it may be, it doesn't have to be the exit. In my case, it was the exit, which is right here. You spawn your monster on it. Then you roll 2d6. And I rolled a nine. Then you find the tile that's marked M9. So I'll just show you here. You can see M3 there. You find the one marked M9, which is right here, and you place the ring of creation on it. That is where it appears. If the tile was empty, there was no monster there, I would draw one and place it there. Then once somebody is able to claim that ring, gets to it, picks it up, the dragon appears, and now there would be two things you have to deal with. And then you have to get there with the ring, kill the dragon, and everyone who is alive gets on the stairs, and you all escape together. If you are playing competitively, you're able to fight each other, kill each other, and when you kill someone, they'll drop the ring, and then whoever gets to the exit, they get out, and then the whole dungeon collapses. Everyone else is just either trapped inside if you are a cruel kind of person, or crushed to death if you're more merciful. And I mentioned earlier, there's the healing pool. If you are playing competitive, each time you die, you lose a life, and you come back at the healing pool, and you do get to keep all of your items with the exception of the ring. If you have died for your final time and you are gone, whatever items you have get left there for someone to pick up. And so that's it. That is how this game works. It's actually pretty simple, and you could actually probably play the entire game in the time it took me to do this video. So what do I like about this game? Well, first off, I like the speed of the game. I really love playing dungeon crawls, but most dungeon crawls, it will take you between 10 to 20 minutes just to set them up, and it's going to take you between 45 minutes if you are flying and you do really well or really poorly, and three hours to play a game. Well, not this one. This one, it takes about three minutes to set up, and that's only because you have all the tiles in this bag here and you have to get them going the same direction. And to play 
a whole game takes no more than an hour. In fact, I played my last two games of this last night and I played an entire game where I actually won and I was playing two characters and that took me only 30, maybe 40 minutes. And then I played another game and I was dead by the fourth tile. And so that took about 10 minutes. You, you get the idea. So I do like just how fast it is. And I also like that it has this vibe of kind of an old school arcade game, you know, Golden Axe and those kind of games. It feels like one of those where there's not a huge plot that you're delving into. You just go out, you play, you fight some monsters, you get the treasure, you kill the dragon, you're done. And, and I like that. I think I like just how portable this game is. The box is small, but you could probably fit everything in here. It might bend your cards a little bit, but maybe fit everything in here and then I don't know, rubber band the cards to or something like that. It, it doesn't take up a lot of space. It's easy to get to the table. And even though there's a lot of tiles and it's not tiny, you'll see that this is every single tile out. I put out everything and this is still fitting on a normal human sized table. So I like that as well. I think the components are all of good quality. And I think that the variety of monsters is quite good. It just so happens that I just pulled out all of the same thing, but I'll flip a couple more over. So here you have a goblin. We have here, we had a skeleton. You see our classic fantasy tropes here. Here we had a, a uh, mud monster and it, it, it goes on and on. And there's also a lovely variety of items that you can find. And there is, of course, as you saw, that delightful trap that I found, which does keep you on your toes. So all of that I like. I also really do appreciate the way that these characters are done. They are all definitely unique feeling. They all have different abilities. They all do different amounts of damage. They all have different amounts of action points in life. It's not so crazy that you feel like there's one character that is definitely better than the others. They all have different abilities, and I really appreciate that you are able to play a male or a female, however you identify or however you want to identify as a hero in this game. I like that. And a special shout out to the fact that even though they're just in silhouette, there's no chain male bikini there. That elf looks like she's actually armored up and can fight. So all of that I really, really appreciate. So let's move on to the quibbles that I have. And I, and I don't have too many. I have two quibbles and one warning to give. And the first quibble is, I do wish that while the components are of good quality, I do wish that there was a little more art to the game. I, I, actually, I actually like the silhouette monsters. I, I actually really appreciate that. I, I find that very fun that they're all in silhouette. But I do wish that maybe there's a little more on the tiles, a little more in-depth art. It doesn't affect the gameplay, and it is actually quite charming, but Maybe I'd like a little bit more, hence it's a quibble. In addition to that, and I suspect this was probably a stretch goal that didn't get unlocked, but maybe even an expansion would be a great thing. Just how cool would it be if each of the meeples had a little bit of a different shape or was screen printed with something? Now that would, I guess, mean that they would need to have a one specifically assigned for each character so you could kind of screen print elf or a dwarf on one. I don't know. So that's just me being greedy, hence it is the quibbliest of quibbles. And my next quibble is that there is, when you play the cooperative mode, less of a sense of danger to the game. Now, I like it. In fact, I only, for the most part, want to play this game cooperatively, but I do need to tell you that you're able to always tag team. So you can just literally stay together, move through the dungeon, and be significantly safer than if you're playing the competitive mode where you have to separate. And time is of the essence because the person who finds the most stuff is going to be the most powerful. Additionally, in the cooperative mode, you are able, you can kind of just stop yourself there and you can just keep shooting at something and you know it's going to be dead, which it takes away a little bit of the danger that you're going to experience if you're doing it fully competitive, because if you're sitting there shooting at something, you're going to run out of action points and then another character is going to run right by you and finish it off or collect the loot. So it adds more urgency to it. And so again, you know, I, I, I put that in as a quibble because I actually prefer the solo and co-op mode to competitive, but 
there, that is just something to keep in mind. And then the warning that I have is simply what I've alluded to already. This is not a deep dungeon crawl. And I just want to make that clear. I mean, it's called bag of dungeon. Like literally that's what it is. It's a bag. You throw it out there. You got a dungeon. You go into the dungeon. So it's just a caution to remember that this is a fast, light game. This is along the lines of deck box dungeon. That kind of fast, I want to play a dungeon crawler. I don't want to spend forever setting it up. I just want to jump in. So it, it's it's like that, though this has more of an epic feel than deck box dungeon. Deck, deck box dungeon has a bit more of a story. It doesn't have a ton of story, but it does have a little bit more. So uh, there you have it, folks. That is bag of dungeon. I enjoy this. This is going to stay on my shelf for the foreseeable future, and I hope that there is some kind of expansion in the future, which, well, I don't know what it would be, but I, I would not be surprised if it was because it did do fairly well on Kickstarter. This is a game that if you are a dungeon crawler lover like me, and sometimes you just want to have that dungeon crawl experience without serious heavy lifting of brain power, and if it's something like Gloomhaven, physical power, then this is a game to check out. It's fast, it's light, it's fun, and it does have the added joy of if you want to do a dungeon crawl where you want to stab each other in the back or kind of go along with the idea that whoever picks up the ring is suddenly possessed or whatever it is, you can do that or you can just kind of get together and have a light, fast, beer and pretzels type of dungeon dive. So that's it, folks. That is Bag of Dungeon. As always, if you know this game and I made any mistakes, please give me the corrections in the comments with the timestamp so I can get that into the Klingon subtitles. As always, thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.